Welcome to this online lesson on the Industrial Revolution. This lesson aims to serve as an introduction to the topic and we'll look at some of the main changes across the period that we'll be studying but also we'll look at one of the crucial reasons why the Industrial Revolution happened here in Britain first. So the aim is to investigate the causes of an event and the origins of a period in history. Ultimately we'll be asking this question. How did the world as pictured in the first picture morph into this? Arguably, the Industrial Revolution is what created the modern world, although that itself is a matter for debate. Here's a do-now task. Which of these inventions do you think were not around during the life of Queen Victoria, who died in 1901? Steam trains, cars, bikes, television, cinema, cameras, aeroplanes and electric lights. Pause the video now while you note down the, uh, the inventions that weren't there or, and the inventions that did exist during the life of Queen Victoria. You might find it helpful to add these to a table. Pause the video while you complete this task. Okay, well let's go through them. Steam trains, and particularly steam locomotives, have been developed even before the reign of Queen Victoria. So, that is one that she very much would have experienced. Indeed, she regularly travelled by train, particularly going down south to Brighton to uh, visit the seaside. In fact, she was rather frightened by their speed. Cars were also developed by the end of Queen Victoria's reign. By the 1890s, things that would be more or less recognisable as cars to us today were in existence, petrol-powered uh, uh, motor vehicles. Bikes, similarly, were invented by this time. The bicycle had been invented and uh, had taken several forms during Queen Victoria's reign. Some of the early ones had no pedals, for example, and of course there's the iconic penny farthing. You might have noticed that actually many of these inventions are in the picture down below. Television was not invented during the reign of Queen Victoria, though. In fact, during her reign, uh, the very earliest experiments in wireless communication were only just beginning, so television was a fair way off and would not be developed until the 1920s. Cinema, on the other hand, was developed. The Lumiere brothers in France had uh, demonstrated several techniques for showing moving images. And so with that in mind, both video and indeed still uh, cameras had been developed during the reign of Queen Victoria and slightly before. Aeroplanes, on the other hand, no. The Wright brothers made their first successful powered flight in 1903, so just after Queen Victoria's reign. That said, uh, there were balloon flights and there were glider flights at this time, with many experiments just leading towards the first successful aeroplanes. And electric lights had been developed, so that is something that would have been a modern marvel at her time. What we're going to do next is we're going to have a look at this artist's impression of a typical British town in around 1750. This is not based upon anywhere in particular, but it shows some of the typical features of towns at this time. This would have been considered a reasonably large town of, uh, for this time. You might want to add now uh, some notes based upon what you see. So take a moment to pause the video, look closely at what you can see, and then afterwards we'll review some of the main features that you might have noticed. So pause the video now while you do that. Okay, one of the things you might have noticed is that there is farmland right next to the town. At this time in 1750, there was an agricultural revolution going on, so farming techniques were developing pretty quickly. Nevertheless, about the most powerful thing that you could expect to find being used by humans was the horse. Indeed, we can see a horse, um, a couple of horses rather, pulling a wagon, and you might be able to see off to the right as well a horse that's using a, a sort of machine. This is something that's called a horse gin, and was a way of uh, hitching a, a horse up to a wheel in order to provide power. This is where we get the term horsepower from. Here's some other things you might have noticed. Perhaps you noticed these people and the fashions that they are wearing. This would have been a very wealthy family, as shown by the clothes that they are wearing. Notice the fashion too, for gentlemen to be wearing wigs at this time. Another thing you may have noticed is that even heavy equipment is being moved by road like this. But note that the road is not particularly well paved. It has grass growing up the middle of it and is largely a construction of mud. This would have made it impassable in bad weather and particularly in the winter. There are the signs of some things changing though. 
we can see a horse-drawn uh, longboat here, which would have been a way of moving uh, goods on canals. And indeed, in the very far distance, we can see what is presumably an aqueduct, which is a bridge for carrying a canal. Uh, and so the canal system was just developing in 1750, but it had a way to go before it became anything like the, uh, uh, the extent to which we see canals across the country today. We can also see the very first factories. This one even seems to have a steam engine. The giveaway is the chimney at the top. Notice the large windows. They're pretty crucial for letting in the light that people would have needed to work by for the, major uh, the maximum number of hours a day. At this time, it would have been uh, basically impossible for them to have effective lighting. Electric lighting and gas lighting had yet to be developed. Now let's have a look at this next scene. This is what the scene might have looked at by 1900. You might notice some things that stayed the same and some things that are different, but it is supposed to show the same town. Again, this is not based upon a real place, but it's designed to give us an impression as to how places might have changed. You might want to note down some of the things that have stayed the same, but in particular, describe what's new or different. You've got plenty of things to choose from, so spend a good five minutes doing that. Pause the video now while you complete that task. Okay, some of the things that you may have noticed have stayed the same is that the old medieval bridges on, across the river are still there, although they do look rather more heavily used with quite a bit more traffic on them. Anything else? Well, the viaduct in the far, far distance is still there. Also, you'll notice the church is still there as well. But what about the differences? And there are plenty. Firstly, let's look at our people again. Yes, the fashions have changed quite substantially over the, the 150 years between 1750 and 1900. But another thing to point out about the people is just how many more of them are. The artist has drawn this to show that the population increased in Britain dramatically during the Industrial Revolution. That's also shown by the enormous growth, growth of the town. We can see new forms of transport, such as this bicycle. And we can see a railway station. You can see a small tank engine is just pulling into the station here. And we can see the growing wealth of towns at this time. This large red brick building is unlikely to be a church and is in fact more likely to be a large civic building like a town hall. Towns that have become successful and wealthy during the Industrial Revolution like to show this off by building grand buildings like this. And many towns across the country still have them to this day. But one other more ne negative impact we can see is that this enormous growth in the number of residential buildings and businesses means that there is far greater pollution. Coal was what powered the Industrial Revolution, but coal is a very dirty and uh, smoke belching fuel. And so we can see the smog and pollution of the coal fires making the, uh, the sky all filthy. So although the Industrial Revolution brought a great deal of progress, some of it was at the cost of the environment, and a price that we are still paying today. Let's get some key terms down. One of the ways that we can understand the Industrial Revolution is by looking at a representation of it. Just like the pictures we have just seen, here we can see the, uh, the centrepiece of the 2012 Olympic Games. Now, you may well be too young to remember this, but I remember it really well. It was a fantastic representation of the Industrial Revolution done through music and through dance. But at the start, it presented England as this green and pleasant land, to refer to an old hymn, uh, and it showed some of the traditional pursuits of the time. You might recognise the Maypole and the game of cricket and peaceful fields and a rather chocolate box style way of presenting the countryside. However, within just a few minutes, this had been torn apart and transformed into this landscape. You can find the London 2012 Industrial Revolution um, uh, set piece uh, on YouTube if you want to have a look at how they did this. The entire thing lasts for about half an hour but is incredibly impressive and to me was one of the most impressive parts of that entire opening ceremony. So why was it shown like this? Well ultimately this helps us understand how the Industrial Revolution is a revolution even if it takes place across a period which seems quite long to us. Firstly, we'll have a look at the word industry. This is a word relating to the making of things in factory and work in general. So we refer to things being industries, don't we? A revolution is a big historical change that's happening quickly. So consider this. 
the Industrial Revolution. This is the period of big changes in work and life. In Britain, this took place between about 1750 and 1900, although arguably you might go back as far as around 1650 or the late 1600s for some of the really earliest developments, and of course you might argue that it goes on beyond 1900 too, with lots more new technologies being developed. But ultimately, if we look at that as a basic date range, we can see that there's been a huge amount of change. We'll be looking at, in this topic at some of those enormous changes. Yes, 150 years is a long time, more than one person's lifetime, easily. But in the whole history of humanity, stretching back thousands of years, the Industrial Revolution is a big change happening quickly. Because after hundreds of years of a largely rural society, with most people living in the countryside and working on the land, within 150 years that had been turned on its head, with most people living in towns and cities and working in factories. So, for now, pause the video while you note down those keywords and their meanings. As an extra challenge, you could give some examples of these that you know from your own life. Pause the video while you complete that. Let's move on. Let's have a look at this artist's impression now. This is actually taken from an old Great Western Railway advert. Such railway posters like this were designed to attract people to their destinations and showed off some of their most impressive engineering achievements. This poster dates from the 1930s, but actually it shows many of the, the developments of the previous century. So your task is to pause the video and then note down how many pictures uh, things within this picture need iron or steel as part of their construction or in order to be made. Pause the video while you do this. It's fair to say that the Industrial Revolution could not have taken place without the mass production of iron and steel. Of course, iron had been made for thousands of years, but largely in very small quantities in very small workshops. The Industrial Revolution was going to change all that though. So let's have a look at some of the examples you might have picked up on. If you didn't note these down, add them to your list as I highlight them. Firstly, and perhaps most obviously, we got the locomotive it itself. This would have largely been made from welded or even cast uh, items of iron and steel. We've also got the bridge. I.K. Brunel is Isambard Kingdom Brunel, one of the most famous civil engineers of the Victorian period. This is the bridge that connects Cornwall to Devon. It is called the Royal Albert Bridge and is just outside Plymouth, going over the River Tamar. Brunel built this bridge partly from stone, but as you can see, mostly from iron components. Also we can see th other items about the railway, things like the ladder, the signals, and the rails themselves. And even tiny things, like this workman's crowbar, they needed to be mass produced and also were made from iron. There are other things as well that you may have noticed, perhaps you noticed the little steamship passing under the bridge. I think the artist has included that there to give a sense of the scale of the bridge and to make it look massive, but it's still a good example of how iron was taking over. After all, in 1750, ships were made exclusively from wood. However, by 1900, they were almost always made of iron, although there were some exceptions. But now we need to consider why iron hadn't been made in such large quantities beforehand. And one of the main limiting factors is the use of charcoal. Yes, that's the stuff that you might burn on your barbecue. But back at before the Industrial Revolution and at its dawn, it was a very much more important material than just something that you'd warm up your sausages with. For thousands of years, people have been making iron, but usually in very small quantities. The fuel for the fires to make iron was charcoal. Coal couldn't be used because it produced too many impurities in the iron. Basically, coal burns very dirty, and all the smoke and gases produces impurities within the iron, so that it's too brittle and cannot really be cast into anything useful. Wood couldn't be used, on the other hand, because it simply didn't burn hot enough. That's another reason why we use charcoal on our barbecues. A wood fire would work, but it would be smoky, and it would take an awful lot of burning down to get it to a nice hot ember that you could actually cook, uh, cook on without spoiling the taste of what you were cooking. In the description, I've got a link to a video which outlines the traditional wood burning techniques used to make charcoal. My cousin's actually done this as part of his work with the Chatsworth estate, and he's told me just how difficult it is. 
You know when he's doing a charcoal burn not to contact him because he's probably going to be very tired and you'll see why. The man describing the charcoal uh, process is, well, let's be honest, incredibly boring. Or at the very least, his, his tone is very monotone. I'm sorry about that. But the thing is, he actually gives a really good detailed description of the difficulties of making charcoal in large quantities, because it's a very delicate process that requires an awful lot of concentration and time. So once you've watched the video that I've linked in the description, note down two parts of a charcoal, ma charcoal making process. And then add at least one difficulty in producing large quantities of charcoal. Pause the video while you watch that. And if you can't see the video, then perhaps you might want to just research the charcoal making process in more general terms. Pause the video and then press play when you're ready to continue. Okay, so the process is pretty involved. First of all, you need managed forests so that you can get the appropriate type of wood. In the video, he refers to it as cordwood. So it's these long, straight and really, really quite thin pieces of wood. You then need to stack it up in a particular way with a flue at the top so that there's just enough oxygen getting to the wood. And then you need to cover it with earth and really manage the burning of it. Ultimately, you're trying to burn only a small amount of the charcoal and just get the rest of it really heated up so it converts into a more of a carbon state. But what about the difficulties in producing large quantities of charcoal? Well, you do not get much charcoal from a very large quantity of wood. So you need to cut down a lot of trees in order to uh, to make it and also we'll need to plant and manage a lot of trees in order to keep the supplies going for any long period of time. Not only that, but it's a very slow process that requires constant supervision. That's why my cousin's so tired when he's doing a charcoal burn, because you cannot leave the charcoal stacks unattended for the entirety of the burn. Because if it gets too hot or too cold, and remember the clue might be with the smoke here, uh, then you will simply be losing charcoal or not producing enough of it. So it's a slow, expensive and laborious process. And if you want to make a lot of iron, you're going to need an awful lot of charcoal. Simply not practical. But this is where our first big development of the Industrial Revolution comes in. Abraham Darby made an absolute breakthrough. And you can see what he used in the picture down below. That isn't coal, nor is it charcoal. That is coke. In order for the Industrial Revolution to take place, huge quantities of iron needed to be produced to create the structures and factories that uh, would make the Industrial Revolution possible. Charcoal made it too expensive and difficult to make lots of iron. But in 1709, Abraham Darby I, a Shropshire iron worker, found that if you heated coal to make coke, it could be used to make iron. And there was loads of coal in Britain. What he discovered is that by heating up co a coal, but not to the extent that it burns, many of the impurities are taken out of the coal and you get a much more pure form of coal. This coke is not as good as charcoal for making iron, but it is good enough and it's available in far higher quantities. His ironworks was in Colbrookdale. Yes, the clue is kind of in the name here. Colbrookdale is a place that has plenty of coal and it became the first modern ironworks in the world using a blast furnace. We can see evidence of Darby's blast furnace in the artist's impression at the top. Your task then. Why, explain why making iron with coke is better than using charcoal. Pause the video while you complete that in a full sentence and then we're going to have a look at how coke and charcoal can be used to make iron using a blast furnace. Pause the video now. So let's have a look at how iron is produced in mass quantities using these fuels. The type of iron that Darby's blast furnace produced was known as pig iron. But why was it called pig iron? Well, a blast furnace produces molten iron that then pours out of the furnace. What you do with it then is you can mould it into any variety of shapes using different moulds. Or you can simply make it into cast blocks of iron that can then be melted down again, further refined and made into other objects using casting. So why pig iron? Here we can see a more modern blast furnace with the, um, the molten iron pouring out. Notice that there are lots of little blocks leading off from the main central flow of molten iron. When this was seen, it reminded the people of the time, who largely grew up in very rural areas, of pigs suckling from mummy pig there. 
You can see that the little piglets are all off in lines to the side, a lot like these little uh, moulds of iron that are coming off the central flow of molten iron. So that's why it's called pig iron. But how do you make it? Let's have a look at how pig iron is made using a blast furnace. First you need the raw material. This is iron ore. This is basically a rock that's got high levels of iron within it. Unfortunately for anyone wanting to use that iron, it's all bound up at a molecular level with the rest of the rock. That said, iron ore is usually pretty t easy to tell because it's got a red rusty colour, and that's literally what it is. The iron within the rock is reacting with the air to create iron oxide, which literally is rust. This iron ore is then poured into a blast furnace like the one shown here. We can see several people working on this. At the top we can see a man with carts of iron ore. He's tipping the iron ore down into the furnace itself. Down at the bottom we can see a man who's got the channel where the molten iron is pouring out. On the other side we've got a bellows which we'll come back to. Now the blast furnace needs to be fuelled by specific fuels that we've covered today. Charcoal can be used and is very good for this but it's very expensive. So you could also use the coke which is much cheaper and more widely available. Ultimately though it's called a blast furnace because of the air that's blown into it. A bellows is used to do this. The bellows could be horse powered, man powered or in more advanced versions it could be used, um, uh, a water wheel could be used to power the bellows. If you've ever blown onto a campfire or a barbecue you'll notice that the embers glow a lot hotter and the fire can flame up a, a lot more. This is because you're adding more oxygen into the mix of that fire making it burn more efficiently and more, and more hot. And that's exactly what the blast furnace is doing. The iron ore will not give up its iron unless it's heated to around a thousand degrees celsius and so it needs to have a very hot burning fuel and plenty of air going into it to work. And the noise that that would make would be a blasting noise, hence a blast furnace. Once the iron ore is hot enough and the iron itself has poured out of the rocks you can then pour molten or liquid iron into moulds. These moulds um, could be of the actual object that you're trying to produce, like a wheel, or more often they'd be made into these little ingots that look like the piglets we saw in the previous slide. These can then be further melted down or refined to make steel, or indeed melted down again and poured into different moulds to make different objects. And really if you can make a mould for it, as long as the iron is suitable and of high enough quality, you can use the iron from a blast furnace for it. And this is one of the things that made the industrial revolution so possible. What you can do now is pause the video here and create your own detailed, illustrated and annotated diagram of a blast furnace. Make sure that you put all of the different stages in and make it clear which order it goes in. With the iron ore added to the blast furnace, with the air and the fuels that would go into that, and then the result which is the molten iron. Pause the video while you complete your diagrams. So now using a coke powered blast furnace it is possible to mass produce iron. So what can you do with it? Well this is what Abraham Darby decided to do with it. Darby's high quality iron was cast into various shapes to make just about anything. This process produced pig iron which was easy to make and very strong but it shattered if it was hit with a sudden shock. For example, if you got a block of pig iron and dropped it onto a stone floor, it is very likely that the pig iron would just shatter a bit like glass. That doesn't make it ideal for all purposes. Nevertheless, Abraham Darby's son and grandson, who were also both called Abraham, one of them is pictured, proved that the iron worked by building the world's first iron bridge in 1779. And this was built at, wait for it, Iron Bridge Gorge. You can still visit it now and you can see it in the picture. Notice that it's put together a lot like one of those construction toys like Meccano. You've got riveted, riveted together cast pieces of iron. But because a bridge is not going to be subject to really sharp, short sharp shocks it's an ideal and strong material for making bridges and iron bridges became much bigger after Abraham Darby had proved the concept way back in 1779. So this was a crucial breakthrough for the Industrial Revolution and demonstrated that mass-produced iron was a useful material that could be mass-produced but also very um, used for a variety of purposes which previously people would never have imagined. So here's what you're going to do now. Using the key information and pictures on this slide produce an ad advertisement for Abra Abraham Darby's Iron Bridge at Colbrook Dale. You might also want to do your own research for this. 
you must include real, real details about the real iron bridge, uh, the real iron bridge, sorry, and the way that the iron was made. You should also compare ironworking before and after Darby's work and explain why Darby's ironworks was better. You could do some independent research to help you present your information. For example, information about the design and even the iron bridge today and how it's preserved. Here are the key facts. Remember that a blast furnace was first used at Colebrookdale using coke instead of charcoal way back in 1709, 70 years before Abraham Darby's bridge was built. Obviously it wasn't the same Abraham Darby all the time, it was his grandson that eventually built the bridge. Coal was cheap and widely available to be turned into coke. Charcoal on the other hand was slow and expensive to get. And also pig iron was strong but brittle and could be made into a lot of things very quickly by moulding molten iron. So based upon this information, based upon your own research, and you remember you could illustrate it as well using some of the pictures I've included here or ones that you find for yourself online, Produce your advertisement now, making sure that you fulfill the success criteria that are on this slide. Pause the video while you do this, and it might take you 20 minutes to half an hour, or possibly longer if you put a lot of research into it and you do some really great illustrations, which is obviously something I'd love to see. Pause the video while you complete the task. So hopefully you can see that molten iron and pig iron, when mass produced using coke, is a vital part of the industrial revolution. Because many of the things that were later built with it relied on the mass production of iron and kind of a refined iron that you can turn into steel. So what about better uh, forms of iron than cast iron? Well, one of the types is wrought iron. Something that is wrought is something that's been worked on. And so what you take is the basic pig iron and you work it to produce a better and more pure version of the metal. Cast iron shatters easily because it is full of impurities, even when coke or charcoal has been used to make it. Wrought iron has many of these impurities bashed out of it, and I do mean literally bashed out of it. It can then be hammered and rolled into shapes like red hot plasticine. We can see a modern reconstruction of an industrial revolution rolling mill here. Notice the rollers are what are being used to produce an iron bar of varying uh, thicknesses. That hot, red hot piece of iron can be placed through there and it's squeezed very much like plasticine can be squeezed through a mould. I've forgot another linked video in the descri description for you to watch. This shows the rolling mill at a place called Blist's Hill, which is very close to where um, Abraham Darby had his blast furnace at Colbrook Dale. It's a living history museum where people take quite significant risks in order to keep the techniques of, uh, of old iron working alive for visitors to see. Yes, it is dangerous and no, I wouldn't like to do it, but I'm really grateful that there are people there who are skilled enough to take those risks and show us how iron was produced at this time. It's also incredibly noisy. So watch the link video. List the processes seen in that video. There should be at least three. Secondly, what dangers can you see from these processes? Thirdly, which stage of the process of making the wrought iron do you think would be most dangerous? And fourthly, how might this differ from a modern ironworks? Pause the video, watch the other video that's linked in the description, and then complete those tasks, and then we'll discuss some answers once you're done. Pause the video now. So the processes that you should have seen are as follows. First, the ingot of iron is taken out of the furnace where it is red hot. In fact, it's probably hotter than that. It's more of a white or, or kind of a golden color. It needs to be this temperature in order to be worked. Then someone with a trolley rushes over to an enormous steam hammer. They have to rush so that the iron doesn't cool down before the process is finished. Because if that happens, you need to put it back into the furnace and heat it up again. Then the steam hammer comes smashing down on the iron ingot and bashes it into a different shape. More than this, though, all the sparks flying out the sides of it are these impurities that they're trying to get rid of. It's making the iron a more pure form of iron. Then, before it's cooled down too much, and once some of the impurities have been bashed out of it, it's taken to the rolling mill. Here the workers place it through the rolling mill in order to make a thinner bar of iron that can be then be worked into different shapes. So what would you make out of it? Perhaps you could make a crowbar out of it or a big rail for a railway. It just shows that this is a stronger, more moldable form of iron that will not shatter quite so easily. 
So which stage of the process might be most dangerous? Well, there are various things to pick up on. For example, the steam hammer itself, you wouldn't want that landing on your foot, would you? Put it this way, it would squash it completely flat. Or what about if your clothing got caught on one of these uh, big tongs that you were, were using and then you got dragged into the rolling mill? I'm afraid you're not going to look like plasticine by the time you come out the other side of this. And don't think that there are any um, emergency stop buttons. There simply weren't. Any other dangers? Well, there's the fact that you're handling red or even white hot iron. If you touch that, it's going to cause severe burns. And you're working with very heavy materials very quickly. If you've ever ran, tried to run somewhere and tripped over, that's bad enough. But try doing it when you're pushing a trolley of white hot iron, and it's a very different pro uh, prospect. Iron foundries were filthy, they were noisy, and they were dangerous environments. And as we're going to see in future lessons, working conditions in the Industrial Revolution for poorer people were often absolutely appalling. So how might this differ from a modern ironworks? Well, first of all, there's a safety factor. Modern ironworks can still be very dangerous, but they take a lot more care over the safety of their workers. Also, a lot of these processes would be much more automated. Rather than having someone running from one side of the foundry to the, uh, the steam hammer, they very likely would just have an automated way of doing that. So finally, what do these changes eventually lead to? Well, we'll, like, we'll have a look at this picture again. Here's some hints. Firstly, we've got new technologies such as iron buildings and new transport like railways and steam engines. We've also got new infrastructure like reliable ro roads, railways and canals. And then there's great wealth, or at least great wealth for some. There were hard, squalid industrial work for others and poor living conditions too, as people crammed into the, uh, the towns and the cities looking for cheap work and often very low paying work. They would also have to live in, t in very crowded and cramped conditions. But also there was a population boom. Britain in 1750 had a population of around 11 million people. By 1900, there were around 40 million. Today it's even more, it's about 65 million. But you can see that this is an incredibly quick pace of change. An enormous population boom in a reasonably short time. Your final tasks then. Which changes do you think had the biggest impact on life? There's no right answer to that, but just make sure you explain why. Explain the link between mass-produced iron and at least one change on this slide. It doesn't have to be one of the ones that I've identified, it could be one that you identify yourself. Then lastly, did this period create the modern world as we understand it today? Explain your opinion. Once you've done those tasks, that's the end of the video, the end of the lesson, and I hope you found it useful. If you did, if you were able to, like this video, and I'll be back for more content soon. But for now, that's the end of the lesson. Thank you and goodbye.